it's one o'clock on Tuesday, March the 15th, 2022. So you must be watching Science at Soast. I'm your host, Pete mcginnis Mark. Every week we bring you young scientists from the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology, streaming live on Zoom from beautiful downtown Honolulu. We try to focus on research that our young scientists are conducting, partly to show the excitement that is there in their research, but also the relevance that they have to here in Hawaii, the community. And today we have a really special guest, Fernanda Hendricks is a researcher at uh, the school's Department of Oceanography. Fernanda, welcome. It's great <laughs> to have you on the show. Um, I understand you've recently been promoted from a postdoc position. So can you tell us what exactly your, your role is at the university right now? Yeah, sure. And yeah, first, uh, thanks for having me here. It's very exciting. Uh, yeah, I'm a researcher, uh, research oceanographer at SOST and at Seymour here. So the Center for Recovery Oceanography and Research and Education. Uh, I do research uh, in the ocean here around Hawaii. So, and I'm an oceanographer through and through. So I have been an oceanographer since undergrad and then went to grad school to be an oceanographer, then did postdoctoral uh, studies in uh, oceanography. And now I am a researcher in oceanography. So it's uh, through and through. And um, your degrees, were they acquired at Manoa or have you come here from the mainland? Yeah, no. So I'm from Brazil. Uh, I lived most of my life there. I did my undergraduate degree there in oceanography. Uh, I did a master's degree in Europe. So I've been traveling a bit. And then for my PhD, I came to uh, to the United States. Um, uh, I was in California for maybe eight years, maybe six okay. years. And I've been here in Hawaii for the last four years. Oh, terrific. While well, you're surrounded by ocean, um, exactly. several thousand kilometers in all directions. So is Hawaii a good place to be an oceanographer? I mean, it's excellent. It's uh, why I wanted to come here. This is a perfect mm -hmm. place to be an oceanographer. There's, like you said, ocean all around. And we have the, the beautiful uh, Hawaii Ocean Ocean Time series here just north of uh, Honolulu. So it's really perfect as, you know, in terms of access to the sea. It's something as, as oceanographers we all strive for is to try to get to the sea and obtain information. So, it, yeah, it's excellent place. Great. Now, we had Nick Orm on the show a few weeks ago. He was talking about ocean color. Mm -hmm. And he just hinted at today's topic, uh, which is underwater drones. So um, I understand that you use this hardware on a regular basis for your kind of study. Um, maybe you can start off. Uh, Michael, can you show us slide one? Uh, and Fernanda, what is an underwater drone or how do you use them? Yeah, so uh, like I said, oceanography uh, relies on data. You know, we need we need to know information about the ocean, and there are several ways to obtain information from the ocean. And the most common way is to get a ship, and you know, you put people on the ship, and then you go out to sea and you collect water, and then you measure a bunch of uh, uh, information from from that water sample. But that's very costly. It takes a long time. It's very slow. So recently now, there are all these uh, underwater vehicles. They're unmanned and they are autonomous. So which means that they can go out to sea without a person, you know, and they collect uh, a lot of the same data that we can collect from ships. So they are these uh, big instruments. They are uh, this, this little yellow one in the middle there, for instance, is an underwater glider. You can point out a little yellow one. Uh, it's a little torpedo shaped uh, instrument and it has all these sensors attached to it. And you can deploy it from the coast or you can deploy it from a, a, a small boat. And this, this, this uh, glider can stay in the water for months at a time collecting data. So you don't have to be present in the ocean to uh, collect that data. So it's very exciting to be able to have those uh, instruments to, you know, to help us out and collect more information about the ocean for us. Sure. And when you talk about collecting data, can you give us a few examples of what measurements might be made? Yeah, if you talk to any oceanographer, the two main things you're ever going to collect is temperature and salinity. So how warm or how cold the water is, where and how much, how many, you know, how, how salty that water is. So those are the two very basic parameters. But these instruments are very sophisticated and they have all different types of sensors that you can, uh, that you, that you can measure. So you have, you can measure oxygen concentrations. So how much oxygen is produced by the algae in the water, or you can measure how many nutrients are in the water, you know. 
that are necessary for, for algae to grow, or you can measure how much sediment is in the water. So there's all different types of instruments that you can attach to these uh, unmanned vehicles uh, to collect information. Okay, and, and all these measurements, do they record them on a, a flash drive or do you get data in real time? Uh, yeah, how do you make yeah, measurements? It's a beautiful thing. So uh, mo most of these instruments that are autonomous, they they are they they can give us data through satellite. So you don't have to to recover these instruments. You don't have to have a little drive inside them. So um, so here you're looking at yeah the first one here you're looking at a profiling float, which is another type of these underwater vehicles. So this is a profiling float. It is that is tube. It's about you know five feet long. And um, it profiles, like the, like, like the name says, it goes from the surface to about 2,000 meters depth, sometimes deeper. So that's, I don't know in feet, but that's very, very deep. Uh, sorry, I do everything in metrics. <laughs> right, about 10,000 feet. So, yeah. There you go. yeah. Uh, and then whenever it comes back to the surface, and, and as the little first uh, drawing was showing there, it, it, it can send the data through a satellite. So it's like a phone, you know, a phone connection. And then it sends all that information and you can download that from your computer. So every, you know, for, for, for most floats, every 10 days or so, you will get a whole new profile of data and you can just access from where, wherever you are. So another beautiful thing about these instruments that you don't have to go out to sea to get the data, they come to you. And then I think the third slide will show a slightly different uh, way of uh, operating this data yeah. collection. Yeah, so the previous one was a profiling float. As the name says, it just profiles up and down and it drifts with the currents. This one is an underwater glider. As you can see here, it looks kind of similar to the previous one. It's also tube shape, but it has wings. So the way it works is that it, 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 it um, profiles the water column in, a, in this sawtooth pattern. And I have a little, I have a little, little one here. I don't know if you can see. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, there you go. It just goes <laughs> okay. up and down in the water column like this in a sawtooth pattern. And it has wings, so it can kind of be maneuvered a little more easily. But none of these instruments, they all, they don't have propellers. They don't have motors. They all rely on just changing. Uh, so they have bladders. Uh, I think the next slide maybe. Uh, has, has an example of how uh, what's actually inside these instruments. So on the bottom there, uh, the, 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 the little yellow part, there's a bladder inside there that inflates. And whenever it inflates, it makes the float go up to the surface. Whenever it deflates, it makes the float sink. So just by doing that over and over, you can profile the water column. So, so just explain a bit more what it is we're seeing in this slide. Um, the left-hand image is presumably someone throwing it overboard and throwing yeah. it carefully, presumably. Um, yeah. But but we're seeing uh, these are cutaway diagrams of what the uh, uh, yeah. The so this is. one. Yeah, this one is really cool because uh, they 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 made these diagrams uh, to to make you look like uh, like they're transparent, so you can see what's inside. Uh, but usually they have this yellow shell around it, and and on, on the left there you can just see the size, right? Like it's about the size of a person or so. Uh, and you can yeah, you can throw it from from the side of the ship. You, people, some people actually throw it from aircraft. So they're pretty adorable little things that you could, there are many ways to deploy them. But then those, those diagrams there on the right, they're just showing you what's inside the float. Uh, so there's some batteries, there's that bladder that I talked about so on the bottom that inflates and deflates to help the float go up and down. On top there, um, or on the right, you can see there's the there's the antenna that that helps you connect to the satellite and gives you the GPS uh, position. So the latitude, longitude, and time of each profile that you're collecting, and and there's there's also some uh, snapshots of some of the the sensors that you can collect, or or or, or that you can attach to these um, profiling floats. So there, the CTD is a conductivity, temperature, and depth uh, sensor. And that's what's going to give you the temperature, the salinity measurements that I was saying before, which are really basic for oceanography. There's also an oxygen sensor, the O2 there. There's an NO3 sensor, which is a nitrate sensor. So the, all types of different sensors can be just attached to this uh, body. And they, these are battery powered. Um, mm -hmm. we, we've had discussions of wave energy uh, on an earlier show, but these sensors rely on batteries. So does the battery run out of power? Is there any way of recharging it? Or do you have to go and pick up the sensor? Hopefully you can reuse it. 
Yeah, that's one of the, 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 the tricky parts. So yes, they're, they're all battery powered. So either alkaline batteries or lithium batteries. Uh, for most, most floats that are up there, uh, they last between three and five years in the ocean. And then after that, the battery dies. So depending on where in the ocean the float dies, you can't really recover it anymore. Uh, but gliders, for instance, because they have those wings and you can maneuver them, as soon as you see that, that they are going down in battery, you can just you know, bring them back to coast and then you can, oh. you can, uh, you can collect them again. But do, do you have any idea how much these things cost? I mean, are they millions of dollars or thousands of dollars? What order of magnitude, how much does one of these drifters cost? Yeah, so there's a huge range. So for a, for a very simple one that has you know temperature sensor or salinity sensor and maybe oxygen, you're looking at about twenty five thousand per float. Uh, but it can go up to you know eighty thousand depending how many instruments you're attaching to it. Now the glider, the one with the with the wings, they're a little more expensive because they have a little you know they're they're a little smarter in a way that you can maneuver them. So they 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 have a little more. Um, um, juice inside, uh, but those can be, you know, around a hundred thousand dollars. So they are not cheap, but compared to, you know, how much it would cost to go on a ship and collect that information, like a ship day, uh, sometimes can cost forty thousand dollars per day. So you know, for right. one instrument of those, you can actually get a lot of information, and you don't have to go out to sea. So fascinating. Now, um, do we build them here in Hawaii, or are these commercially available? They are commercially available. There are a few, uh, few companies that sell them, uh, mainly in the US and in France. Uh, they're the, the, the two main um, like regions where you, yes. where you can buy them. Mm -hmm. But uh, universities uh, um, develop them. So the University of Washington has a big program for that. So we, we, we partner with them a lot to, to, look, uh, to look at floats and gliders, but they are commercially available, yeah. And I would imagine just building one of the instruments might be something that we could accomplish at the University of Hawaii and uh, you know put it on somebody else's drifter or the gliders. Well, exactly. Is that done? Is that done? Yeah, so uh, we we can definitely attach our own own instruments to it. The only tricky the uh, the main tricky part is that we need a big tank to test them, and then sometimes that like you know universities don't have access to a big tank where you can uh, dump them in the water there. But I think here it's even the tank uh, is there. What you mean. Um, like um, a big swimming pool where you can, you know, mm -hmm. uh, sink the 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 floats right. and check if it's uh, properly balanced, and uh, so that sometimes takes a little more infrastructure than than most universities. Well, we, we, we've got the pool down in the quarry. I mean, that's an opportunity. I would thought. That's true. That's true. But I think I, I even think here they have a they have a program or a, a few years ago where they were trying to develop really cheap autonomous vehicles. So there are lots of uh, you know even as a, a grad school projects that you can uh, deploy a little a little like both surfboard with instruments on it and have it go somewhere. So there there are ways to make it cheaper too, and you know especially if it's for coastal uh, applications, which is a little closer to home here. If you don't have yeah. to you know to have the thing go super far away, there are definitely cheaper ways that you can do it. Right. Now, I think your fifth slide really surprised me. Mm -hmm. um, if we can take a look at that one, yeah, yeah. I, I was um, quite impressed by the number of measurements uh, that these autonomous vehicles, these underwater yeah. drones can actually collect. Um, it, it explains to the viewers, you've got two global maps here. Um, yeah. The gray areas are land masses, right, for exactly. uh, the viewers, okay? Yeah, so on the left here, you're looking at, you know, if, if, if floats did not exist, if, if none of these autonomous vehicles existed, that's every little dot there, they look like lines, but they are little dots. They are each location where a ship one day has been to collect some sort of data. So the, 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 the black colors is, you know, up to 10 measurements and the purple colors is, you know, more than 200 measurements. So you can see there that, that you know, over the whole history of us collecting data in, in, in oceanography, uh, most places in the, in the ocean, they only have one to 10 data points. And the ocean, you know, they are changing over time. So if we only have one to 10 uh, data points in time, that's not enough to understand what's really happening in the ocean. But then 
with this, this, these deployments of these profiling floats and gliders and other autonomous vehicles, we have been able to extremely expand the amount of information that we get from the ocean. And that's on the on the right there. So those are the little dots of, you know, um, uh, data obtained from profiling floats and other autonomous vehicles. So it's huge amounts compared to what we can do with ships alone. So would it be correct to say, looking at these two diagrams, uh, there were few data in 2018, but the vast number of colored dots in the January 2019 image is actually showing that this huge development of uh, uh, underwater measurements from from drones um would that be uh representative of where we are today or is there in fact a similar increase in number of data points being collected year after year yeah so so, the, so we uh there's a program so the argo program they aim to have about 4,000 floats at any time in the ocean. So that would mean you know, one float every 200 kilometers in the ocean, more or less. And they have reached that goal. So every day you just, you know, like every year you just keep putting a little more floats just to, you know, some of them die and then just replace them. So that's about 150,000 profiles per year that we get. But there are other types of floats as well. So the, 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 the numbers are increasing over time, yes. Okay, and so you're, you're saying a few thousand of these floats at any one time in the Argo program, but each float might cost, let's say, average $50,000. So this is quite an expensive endeavor, right? Excellent. So um, someone in Hawaii, you know, why, why would they be very interested in this sort of global data set? Wouldn't it be better just to concentrate the measurements closer to the Hawaiian islands, for example? Well, we are in an ocean and we are in a planet, right? That whatever mm -hmm. happens here happens everybody, everywhere else. So if we all know about climate change, for instance, uh, climate change is one of those things that we have been able to observe from profiling floats. They are measuring temperature and are measuring salinity everywhere. And from, from them, you can, like, we can actually see how the water is warming up over time. And because of these profiling floats, not only have we been able to see that the surface of the ocean is warming up, which we have been able to see before from even from here from Hawaii, uh, but also the bottom of the ocean is warming up. So that means that the entire, you know, ocean system is warming up, which is pretty serious. And, you know, what happens when water warms up, it expands and that means sea level rise. So, um, which is one of one of the reasons why sea level rise happens because of the expansion of the water because of warm, uh, it, it being warmer. So we should all really care about where that's happening because we are all affected by it. In the last week, for example, Noah presented uh, his analysis of sea level rise around uh, Waikiki uh, and he touched on the fact that the sea level is rising partly because the ocean's getting warmer. You're able to provide that kind of information that uh, even at great depths and presumably you know, uh, many hundreds if not thousands of feet below the surface the water's changing its temperature as well as the chemistry uh, has that been detected? Exactly. Yeah, that's that's perfect. Fine. And uh, uh, yeah, for instance, the pH of the water, right? The, how, how acidic the water is. We've also been able to measure from these floats that the water is getting more acidic uh, because of the extra CO2 or carbon dioxide that's been added to the ocean because of burning of fossil fuels. So we have been able to monitor all those changes, all these autonomous vehicles and, you know, uh, throughout the entire ocean. And you do need to have all of these data everywhere. Okay to be able to really see what's happening in a global scale. Okay, and uh, viewers will uh, hopefully see a future program where we're actually looking at the impact of changing acidity on coral reefs, which of nice. course are really, really close to home. So your studies are providing background information, not only on sea level rise, but indirectly on the health of coral reefs or the ability of coral to, to grow around the Hawaii Islands. Okay. Absolutely. So uh, you got some other slides. Um, do we do we want to look at uh, uh, number six, which I think is an Argo diagram? Um, I modified this. I put red dots on. Uh, this is uh, early twenty twenty two data set. Um, what kind of map is it that we're looking at here? 
Yeah, so here, here we're looking at a map of all of the, it's called the biogeochemical Argo, which before I talk mostly about the Argo program, which has mm -hmm. mostly temperature, salinity, oxygen, which are more uh, uh, primary variables that we measure in the ocean, pr primary properties. And these, these yeah. red dots here are the complementary to that data set. So they have more complex data. So here you're looking at about 500 points more or less. And those are all the floats that have ever been deployed that have other instruments. So they are measuring the amount of sediment in the water or the amount of algae in the water or you know, nutrients and pH. So there's many, so, so, so there are less of those uh, more complex floats in the water compared to just temperature and salinity. And, uh, but still it's a lot. And, but, but you can see that some areas in the ocean are still, you know, there's no information there. There are no floats in certain regions. Right, including uh, between Hawaii and Alaska, there are very few of yeah. them there. So. Yeah. Uh, and and just for completeness, the colors, uh, is that temperature or is that um, ocean color or, or what is the uh, the rainbow? showing yeah us. yeah so the the color in the background there in the ocean so the whites are, are the continents and the uh land, mm -hmm. land masses and the, the the color is chlorophyll so that's an indication of that there is the presence of algae in the ocean so there are certain regions that you have you know more of those some regions you have less of those okay uh, and that's just uh snapshot in time or that's a, a sort of a, a monthly average yeah, that one is a it's a monthly. No, let's see, it's a yearly average, but just during during spring. Okay. So we just okay. pick pick all the springs, and then you have the average. That's what it looks like. All right, and I think as we're we're um, a little short on time, let's jump ahead to slide eight, okay. um, which I believe shows um, a similar kind of data plot um, on a smaller area, right? Yeah. Um, can you talk us through the these the gliders? Uh, yeah. I like so, it particularly because you've got changing days, right? To look at the temporal variability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is an example of how gliders can be used in very coastal environments. So here, uh, these are little graphs of the white part. There are uh, is the seafloor. So you're looking at the ocean from the side. So the white is the is the bottom of the ocean, and the blue colors is the actual ocean. And the mm -hmm. colors going from blue to red is the amount of sediment in the water. So the redder it is, the more sediment in the water there is. And, and, and then what, what, what you're looking at is, you know, every day or so uh, for a period of uh, 12 days, I think it's a 12 day period, uh, you can see how that section of the water changed. And this was during a storm, which is really, really cool because, you know, we, we can't usually put ships in the water when there's a storm, but we can put one of those unmanned vehicles. And this is just showing you how the, the water really changes as a storm passes by. Okay, so um, the, the vertical axis is depth below sea level. So sea level would be um, where, where each of the days. Okay, I would guess this is a really useful thing for people who are worrying about beach nutrition in terms of putting sand back on Waikiki Beach or um, worrying along the, the east coast of Oahu. You can really tell where the sand is moving around in that. Absolutely. And then also for, you know, biologists also want that because yeah. there are organisms living on the bottom there who are affected by all of these sediment moving around. So yeah, lots of applications. And, and there's day to day changes, right? You know, yeah. Between 1st of December and December 7th, you know, a week is completely different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we, think okay. we we tend to think of the ocean as this, you know, big blue blob, and there's a lot going on underneath there. And these right. things help us check it out. And your last slide, slide yeah. nine, I think, shows also uh, just some of the experiments which you and your colleagues have been conducting north of uh, the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, yeah, what, so those what are, are the, these yeah. two diagrams? Yeah, so that's the how I announced uh, the black lines are the tracks of the glider. So these are the, the I just picked the two last gliders that we've had here that were deployed uh, near here. And uh, th there's a website there that, you know, people watching can go to the website and actually check out these data. So if you want to see what the water looks like around that region, you just click on that website and you can see all these different properties. Right. I mean, the diagrams themselves um, where the colors represent mm -hmm depths to the yeah. ocean floor. Okay. Exactly. So obviously around Oahu and Maui, it's relatively shallow. 
yep. and you send the the gliders around the deeper parts of the the ocean mm -hmm. um, it looks like uh this uh monitoring station station aloha uh the red dot is that where a lot of the experiments are being done yeah so we visit that station every month or or roughly every month so that's when we get the opportunity to to deploy these instruments and it's you know much safer to deploy them in a deep area because we know it's not, not going to hit anything uh but yeah and then we we can because, it, uh, because they have wings and they can be maneuvered you can send yeah. them anywhere you want so if you see a cool feature you can just okay go check that feature and see what's going on in there so the gliders are super useful for that when you get the data in real time you might get several data dumps every day so you can yeah. respond to a condition uh, and viewers who are, who are looking at this i really would encourage them to take a look at this website um i went on it yesterday and i had yeah. great fun because there's lots of photographs of yeah. the pilots and uh i'm guessing that uh fernanda you can't drive one of these things it needs a uh, special expertise but uh, yeah you need a website, computer yeah, you need a computer and a connection to the internet, and then you can pilot them from far away. Oh, really? So that yeah. that's all that is needed, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Some kind of protocol that you know you have to be in charge of the the research project to steer it. To, oh, definitely. People. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's not simple. So we have people here at, at, at SOS who do that, and uh, but it's a uh, it's a uh, it's simple in the sense that you don't have to be present there for it to happen, or you can do it remotely. So that's very powerful. Right. Uh, and one final question. None of these um, uh, drones have cameras on board. Has, has anybody thought about putting underwater cameras to take a look at, say, the ocean floor or uh, look at uh, organisms in the water column? Yeah, that's a great question. There are definitely floats or and uh, gliders that have cameras attached to them. They are even these very special uh, imaging instruments that can, you know, take pictures of microscopic uh, instruments or or microscopic uh, organisms. So yeah, those definitely because they're very expensive, but it can yeah. definitely be done. And I would imagine the the data rate would be quite high for exactly. an image, particularly if it's a color image. You yeah. need a lot more bandwidth to the satellite communications. Yeah. Yeah. The cool thing is that the glider you can recover. So at least you, know, right. you can yeah. have it saved. Hoping, and yeah. Yeah. Hope you can recover. <laughs> well, Fernando, I'm afraid we've run out of time. So uh, I want to thank you again for being on the show. Let me remind the viewers you have been watching Science at SOST. I've been your host, Pete McGinnis Mark, and my guest today has been Fernando Hendricks who is an oceanographer, and we've been hearing about underwater drones. So thank you very much for watching today. And until next week, goodbye from me and goodbye from Fernanda. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.